This program contains adult content. Hey, is there a God? A uh, big atheist. Really? What, am I an idiot? Come on. But yes, it would be nice if you could throw your sins and your responsibilities on someone else. But it's not true. It looks like far left lunacy. I don't believe that it's true that religion is moral or ethical. You don't need to follow anybody! It's not human intelligence! If someone doesn't value logical consistency, what logical argument are you going to give them that will demonstrate that they should? Welcome to the Godless Revolution. Hello, Rebels. Hi. Hello. And hello to you. Mr. Larimer, thank you so much for joining us again I'm, this evening. I'm happy to be here. In the, in the wake oh, of yeah. Matt's absence. Yes. He, he had something really pressing tonight. He could not miss it. We he all, was very excited about it. Because Extremely he loves excited. it so much. Yeah. So <laughs> Matt got to go to a screening of Wonder Woman tonight. I'm so jealous. Woo-hoo. And he's a guy. Yeah, I know. And they let him in. And they let yeah. him in. <laughs> Weird. And we all know how much he loves superhero yes. movies. Oh, yes. I bet he is going to be glowing next week with reviews <laughs> on that movie. <laughs> it was, it's a work function. So, it, so it's with people that he works with, and they're going to see a superhero movie. And with, with as much of a uh, misanthrop- mis- misanthrope yeah. as Matt is, I'm sure, you all know how much he would rather be here talking to you. <laughs> But when your boss buys out a theater and, and yeah. invites, you know, the entire company. And the wife is excited to go see yeah. the movie. It's kind of hard to say now. <laughs> yeah, he said Danielle was, I'm, I'm excited to see it. It looks like a yeah. cool movie. No, it looks, I mean, it, yeah, looks like, it, looks great. it looks like DC may actually have a decent superhero movie under yeah. their belt here very soon. So, Took them long enough. <laughs> oh, Christ. I, I can't think of a decent one. Like, and, and it, I, don't, I mean, it the kills ba- me. <laughs> the Batman begin the Dark Knight trilogy. I I liked. Oh yeah, I mean some of, some of those are okay, but well, I've heard critics say it's better than the Dark Knight trilogy. Oh, that'd be wonderful. And here's what I think is even more badass. I can't remember what her name is in the movie that plays Wonder Woman. Gal Gadot. Gal Gadot. That's why I can't remember because I wouldn't be able to pronounce it if I yeah. thought. <laughs> and she's also a real life fucking badass. Yeah. She like when she's fighting in the movie, she learned how to do that shit real with the fucking Israeli army. Oh yeah. Oh okay. She, she, she got she got trained in hand to hand combat in the Israeli army. Wow! So it's like not is only is she Superwoman, but she's legitimately a badass in real life. Superwoman? What, what was it? Jeez. Wonder 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 Woman. Wonder Woman. That's where Wonder we go. Woman. See, I I know my comic books like the back of my hand, and I got a new mole. Su- Superwoman is. <laughs> not sure there's a super. Well, she there's is pretty super, super. Girl, but she is. Super. <laughs> she. <laughs> Christ, man, the whole like the the. The theme song for the for the old TV show was "You're a Wonder Wonder Woman," like, <laughs> and you think I saw that? I was born in 1984, probably uh, before his time. Yeah, uh, yeah, it could be. <laughs> yeah, another badass is uh, what's his name on uh, Arrow? The guy who plays Arrow? Yeah, the guy who plays Arrow. Yeah, he's he's like a real. He was on uh, so NBC or whoever is doing their red nose thing. Yeah, uh, for the, uh, the the comic relief thing to raise money for raise money for child yeah. children's yeah. health children's yeah. health around the world and all that. Yeah, and they did one of their American Ninja Warriors celebrity things, uh-huh. and and he was Amar whatever his name is, but he was on it and he. He just kicked ass on that thing. Oh wow! That guy is apparently he does all his own stunts on Arrow. And, okay, he does all that that pole thing that you yeah, know, the climbing pole. I thing. can't do it. He he does that. I can't do a fucking pole. I would I, break my teeth <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> no, so yeah, so that's what Matt is out doing okay. tonight. Is Thursday, June first. This is episode one hundred fifty nine. I, I have not released episode 158 as the, of the time oh, of this recording, okay. but uh, that should be going out fairly soon. Um, I've just I've been fucking sick, man. Yeah, super fucking sick, and I'm still sick. I still have a nasty cough and I'm congested and feel just kind of weak and run down. But I do feel better than I have for quite a while. I'm just glad I didn't get the bug that you had because I was over it in like. Four or five days. Man, this has been going on since May 8th. Yeah. May 8th was the first day that I noticed, ah, fuck, I'm, I'm actually getting sick. <laughs> like, I tried to deny it for a while, and, and on the 8th, I was like, no, I'm, I'm actually sick. And then it just got 
worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. <laughs> and yeah, it, it's still like last night I ended up having a coughing fit and banished myself to the couch. I don't, did I meant, did I mention that? I, I, I oh, I told you, you guys. You told us that. You yeah. told us that. Yeah. My brain still doesn't quite work what, <laughs> yeah. as well as it should. Um, yeah. I've, I've, I've known in the last few weeks, I've known a lot of people who have been getting sick. Uh, something chemtrails. around chemtrails, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's but usually it's like 24, 48 hour thing. Yeah. I, I don't know anyone that's had something hold on as long as it. Oh man. Well, and Tracy was sick for a while and she's still got a nasty cough. I mean, mm. she's had a cough now for a couple of weeks that mm. just is lingering, you know, it just won't fucking go away all the way. Maybe you need to do more GMOs. I mean, maybe it's <laughs> drink more alcohol. No, I think I think part of my problem is just that I keep pushing too hard. Like mm-hmm. instead of resting when I should be, I'm, you know, I, I'm super busy with all kinds of shit. So I'm constantly out doing something, and then when I'm not doing something that I feel obligated to do, I still would like to get out and do something I just want to do. Yeah. So. You know, rather than staying home and resting, I went out golfing uh, last week, and the following day was just fucking dead. Like, well, that and then that's why me and Matt both were talking last week. And we're like, "You want to go over there and do the show ourselves?" We're like, I don't think Dan will be able to just not come into the basement <laughs> and yeah. not take part in a way. Yeah. So maybe it's best if we don't even go over there and just let Dan sleep for the night. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been hard. And I did like, I just, I sat on the couch and just fucking zoned out and uh, that. So when I, it, it's really rare that I would say, Hey, we probably shouldn't do a show or you guys can, but I won't because I love doing the show. And and that's why we thought you'd have a hard time. Not like be like, even if you just came in here, like I'll run the computer for you guys. But like, yeah. no, you're going to jump in at some point. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it would have been hard, but I mean, but that should tell you how sick I was, just that I was like, we we might not want to do it because, yeah, I just, I couldn't fucking think straight. <laughs> I just felt weak as shit. I was coughing and yeah, it was just, I was a mess. Yeah. I, I was more sick than I've been in a very long time and still I'm getting over it, but I am starting to feel a little bit better progressively, little bit by little bit, but hopefully it will go away soon. Yeah. We had Tracy's brother and uh, his girlfriend in town with us over the weekend and until today. They left earlier this morning, and I feel bad because I I couldn't really hang out with them. I tried, like, one one or two nights while they were here uh, socializing and having a drink and staying up, whatever, and just paid for it the next day <laughs> like like it just see, it seems like something like well, yeah. I, i'll feel like i'll feel a little bit better i'm like oh okay yeah i can have a few drinks and hang out with them and then the next day and for the day after that i'm just totally spent your, so. your, your body's trying to fight the alcohol and the sickness yeah so probably a big portion of the reason it's been around this long is because i'm just fucking stupid <laughs> <laughs> and, and i do dumb things instead of resting when i should i'm i'm still trying to do other shit that i should just put aside for a little while and and rest up but anyway i'm i'm feeling a little better good and and you have a little bit of a cough still a bit yeah i mean there might be a coughing fit in the future i don't know could be <laughs> maybe so <laughs> and how are you feeling grant i'm i'm feeling all right i my my voice has kind of been going in and out i'm, I'm a little bit hoarse right now mm. but i wasn't hoarse earlier today it, uh. it just kind of pops in for a few hours and and i sound like this or sometimes worse and then it just goes away and so it's probably just pollen or something but hmm. that's what you said like four weeks ago when you started <laughs> coughing too, so. yeah it's probably just allergies a little probably bit just allergies. <laughs> i'll be fine but no, i'm feeling all right well good good uh, on tonight's episode we will be interviewing mr gleb sipersky I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. It sounds very interesting talking yeah. about the truth, the truth pro, pledge, pro, pro truth, truth, truth pledge. pledge. Yeah, yeah. Um, where people basically just pledge to tell the truth as much as possible in, in what they're doing, in the facts and information they're sharing, and it sounds very interesting. He's been all over the place. Yeah, uh, in reading through his bio and some of the information he sent us. I mean, he's 
been on countless other podcasts and TV shows and written stories for all kinds of skeptic magazines and websites, and he's been on television shows. He's all over the place. And I watched a video of him earlier, and he's got a cool Russian accent, too, so that should be fun. So we already like him. <laughs> yeah. It will be very interesting. I mean, you know, we we have to get on the good side of the Russians. I mean, you know, let's... They are soon to be our overlords. <laughs> They're so. soon to be our overlords. <laughs> yeah. Keep forgetting to wear my... Uh... My Navy yeah. Yeah. Russian hat over. Well, the way, the way you were that. gesturing, I was thinking Yamaka. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that would go over well with the Russians. Uh, they love the Jewish. Uh, <laughs> well, should we move on to the interview? Get him on the phone, and uh, then we've got some news and stuff that we can do afterward. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, let's do that. This is Matt Delahunty, and you're listening to The Godless Revolution. Peace be with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming out, y'all. Oh, boy. What a turnout. Uh, well, it is a big day. Today, we answer mankind's most pressing question. Namely, what the hell's going on? Rejoining the Godless Revolution podcast now. Okay, on the line we have Mr. Gleb Sapersky. You may have heard him on The Scathing Atheist. Inciting Incident, By Any Means, Danthropology, Stark Truth Radio, The Gaytheist Manifesto, Cellar Door Skeptics, or one of several other podcasts recently. You probably read articles from him in just about everything that you would read anywhere. <laughs> He's made multiple appearances on several different uh, news programs and talk shows, and we are lucky enough to have him online with us via Skype tonight. How are you doing, Gleb? I'm doing great, and thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, you had contacted us a while back and mm -hmm. we've just been trying to schedule you some time to get on the show. So we're very happy to have you on here. You wanted to talk to us tonight about the pro truth pledge. What is Correct. that? So the pro truth pledge is basically a way to reverse the tide of lies in politics. It's very unfortunate that our politics right now is not characterized by a very truthful environment. We can know that. In fact, Oxford Dictionary chose post-truth politics as the word of the year in 2016. Oh, the wow. word of the year. And so, and that's because, and uh, defines post-truth politics as basically a political environment characterized by lies and deceit and appeals to emotions and personal beliefs winning out over appeals to facts. So it's not like politicians didn't lie before. Sure they did. <laughs> but, you know, no question. But, Post-truth politics is an environment where these lies and deceits and personal appeals, emotional appeals win over appeals to facts. And that's what happened in the U.S. and the U.K. election process in 2016, which is why Oxford Dictionary chose post-truth politics as a, its word of the year. So I've been working on how to get people to think more rationally and truthfully for a while now. And I shifted a lot of my attention to politics, as well as the organization I run, Intentional Insights. It's a nonprofit. 501c3 nonprofit, founded about three years ago. I'm also a professor at Ohio State, researching decision-making, why people do what they do, why they decide what they decide. And so a um, team of behavioral scientists, including myself, decided to team up to create a way to reverse the tide of lies in our political system. And that's what the approach of Pledge is about. That's It just is meant to do exactly that. Get people to commit to truth-oriented behaviors. So that's the focus of the Pro Truth Pledge, and it's at protruthpledge.org for your listeners who want to follow along with us while we talk about it. So it's always good to be checking it out while we're yeah. talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly sounds like a lofty goal. How do you, how does one go about uh, holding people accountable for these types of misstatements and and false statements and and putting out what our what our dear leader refers to as fake <laughs> news? Alternative yes. facts. Yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 indeed. So there are a couple of uh, avenues we can talk about. Do you want to talk about how you hold, uh, how you get private citizens to not share fake, fake news? Or do you want to focus on public figures? I can focus on either and it's fine. We can, we have time. <laughs> um, I'd like to do both. Let's, let's start though with, uh, private citizens because I know sure. that, you know, whenever I see something that I know is demonstrably false, I try to 
point out that it is false to somebody. And a lot of the times I'm met with a lot of resistance. Um, yeah, I totally hear you. You know, and that, well, that can range from anything from just outright denial or somebody being upset that I would point out that something is wrong. Or I've yeah. even heard from other people every now and then that, well, yeah, I know it's false, but I think it's funny. So I put it out there anyway. Uh, yeah, it's so frustrating. You know, I totally hear you. You are a true foreign individual. And all three of you are true foreign individuals, you know. Uh, and I feel for you, Dan, Ryan, Grant. I feel for all of your audience. <laughs> you know, I feel for all of your audience. You know, it's so frustrating when you try to talk to someone and you tell that person, hey, this is not true. And they're like, I don't care. <laughs> and they're like, well, I deny it. I deny it's not true. Prove to me it's not true. And then when you prove it to them, they're like, well, now I don't like you anymore. And you're not my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the proof you give them, this is great. The, the proof you give them, they deny that this is proof. They they deny the, the truthfulness of the facts yeah. you're providing. Yeah. yeah they say it's, exactly. it's, you know, liberal leaning cr- facts or, you know, it's yeah. bought and paid for or whatever. Yeah, so um, the problem with me and the three of you and the vast majority of your listeners is that we are outliers. We're different from the, you know, to get serious for a minute, we're different from the vast majority of American society. We care about the truth. We care about facts. And <laughs> unfortunately, the large majority of Americans do not have nearly as much a concern for facts and truth as we do. You know, otherwise, I mean, I mean, they wouldn't be staying so much in religion and all these other things that we can talk about, but that's kind of a side issue. Mm. But uh, anyway, so we have to realize that we are outliers. We're different. But the, I get so frustrated and sad when I see reason-oriented people try to talk to other people who aren't reason oriented as if they are reason oriented. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and it's, it's ultimately frustrating. Yeah, it's very frustrating. And you know what? It's frustrating for the person who's emotion oriented too. Uh, you know, he's like, well, why are you giving me reason? I don't care. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, f- I find myself wanting to stoop to their level every so often, but I'm like, I sh- can't do that. <laughs> I hear you. And it's, it's really frustrating. So uh, there are a number of ways which you can actually, which have been shown to work by behavioral science. So I'm a behavior, I do research in the field of the history of behavioral science. So there are a number of ways that research shows can work to get people who aren't already concerned with the truth to be much more concerned with the truth than they are. And so here, here are some ways. One is before the fact, remind them of what are the basic standards and principles of what is true. So research shows that people who are reminded of their sense of ethics and values are much less likely to cheat. I'll, I'll give you a fun study. People are asked to solve a variety of problems and get a monetary reward if they solve the problems. And they self-report on how successful they are when they solve those problems. Now, you have a control group which just self-reports, and then you have another group uh, which is asked to remember what was it, the Ten Commandments, actually, mm. when before they uh, do the study, do the test. And for some reason, for some magical reason, the group that is asked to remember the Ten Commandments before they do the tests, they, they solve many less problems and they get much less money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's magic, you know? Remembering the Ten Commandments apparently makes you dumber. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course it does. What it does is it reminds people, and this this actually a uh, funny thing, it, it's been tested on atheists too and it actually works on atheists. It's not about the Ten, ten Commandments. It's basically about reminding yourself of a sense of ethics and values. So getting people to commit and remember values and ethics in advance of the conversation is much more effective than in the heat of the moment, getting them to try to change their minds. So science communication uh, finds that this is quite effective as well. If you have a conversation with people that doesn't start at like, do you believe in global warming? But it starts with, hey, here are the principles of science. And here's how science works. And you do experimentation and you find this evidence and you update your beliefs based on new evidence and so on and so on. And through this process, here's the evidence that we find that tends to indicate that there's human caused global warming. People are much more likely to buy that sort of <laughs> approach <laughs> than, than, than saying reasonable scientists tell you that there's global warming. Here's evidence. Believe it. Yeah. You know? 
So you and I would buy the second one because like we trust scientists, but most people don't. They they don't have that sort of trust. So if you get people to commit in advance to a set of principles that are oriented toward the truth, they are much more likely to be true for you as a result. So if you get them to buy into this. And that is one of the functions of the Pro-Truth Pledge at protruthpledge.org. So if you go to that, you can see that there are 13 truth-oriented principles, and I'll just read through several of them. I'll strive to avoid sharing misinformation, even in service to a cause I believe is good. Before I share my information, I'll make a reasonable effort to ensure it's true, for instance, by using reliable fact-checking websites or evaluating the scientific consensus on a topic. Um, Defend. I'll defend. I'll endeavor to defend others when they come under attack for sharing the truth, even if we have different values. Celebrate updating. I'll gladly celebrate those who retract incorrect statements and update their beliefs toward the truth. So, if you imagine, you know, and there are nine more, and all of the listeners can read through them while we're talking here. It's at approachofpledge.org. If you imagine a society where all people commit to these principles before they have conversations and remind themselves about these principles, we would have much more effective conversations, much healthier ones, where people are much less likely to cheat, which means lie in this case, and deceive each other. So that is a really important behavioral science principle for why we want everyone to sign the pledge. Have, having conversations come more from a logical standpoint than a uh, from the from the heart as or an emotional standpoint. Mm -hmm. Well, not quite actually. So. It's uh, what the research suggests is that if you remember the principles, if you remember your ethics, then your emotions actually steer you okay. toward more ethical behavior. So it's not against emotions. So here's where here's the key that uh, these people who are, you know, the large majority are not, you know, very oriented toward truth and reason. If you point out to them these things before they engage in conversation. And so uh, beforehand, then their emotions steer them more toward these behaviors. So you get them emotionally engaged with truth oriented behavior. And mm -hmm. so get them to commit to it. And if you get them to commit to it, and there are a number of things like this. So for example, um, or recycling, uh, recycling is a good example where people who were shown directions on recycling, uh, versus people who pledged to the, were shown these directions and then pledged to commit to this recycling. They were quite a bit more likely to actually recycle than just people who showed, who were shown information on recycling, which in turn were more likely to do recycling than people who had, who weren't given any information. So you have kind of this graduated process. People who don't have any information, they're a baseline control group. People who are shown information on recycling recycle more than people who are just not given information. Then people who commit who pledge to recycle after being shown this information are even more likely to recycle. So that's kind of another piece of evidence for how if people pledge, if they not simply read through them, but if they actually take the pledge and commit to these behaviors, they are quite a bit more likely to engage in these behaviors. <laughs> so I do, I do most of my arguing these days with fellow atheists for some reason. It seems like Everybody wants to nitpick or argue about everything under the sun. And because I, because I argue with fellow atheists, rather than having them remember the, the Ten Commandments, what, can you give us a real world example of how to start a conversation where, you know, let's say I, I see that somebody has posted something that is false. And by way of reminding them of ethics and values, how would I start that conversation? Sure, that's a great uh, uh, question. So if you see somebody posting something false, I think a good step in that case is to ask them where they got their information. So use curiosity as opposed to say that's wrong. Then you get, uh, then your allies, you put yourself on the same side as they, and you express curiosity. You, uh, you ask them for help. You know, hey, can you show me where you got this information? And so then your allies working on figuring out where is the source of this information. And then you can together figure out that the source of this information is incorrect and or correct. I mean, as you may be wrong too, right? So <laughs> at this situation, if you ask that sort of question in not in a hostile way, but in a curious way, that's what the research suggests is going to get you much more likely uh, response that results in both people orienting more toward the truth. 
both people orienting more toward accuracy than hostility and confrontation and arguments. So it sounds like it's good to start out with with a charitable view of what they're saying and and with a genuine amount of curiosity, like approaching it as if you yourself could be wrong and yeah. and you would like them to help explain why what they've posted or what they believe is actually the truth. Yes, that's right. So that is the situation if you are arguing with, if you anticipate a, a tension with a fellow atheist, with a you know person you know is likely to be reasonable. So there are a number of other strategies that you can uh, do. You can do things like, uh, so this is, I published an article on this. This is a strategy called collaborative truth seeking, where you both orient toward figuring out the truth and trust each other to care more about the truth than about winning for your perspective. <laughs> so you enter, so you make that explicit statement. You say, hey, I care more about the truth than I care about, you know, my beliefs. Let's orient together to figure out who has the truth and who is closer to the truth. You know, maybe you're both wrong. Who knows, right? Maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. Mm. It's far from always in somewhere in the middle, but sometimes it is. So let, let's figure it out. Let's, let's work together to collaborate and figure out what the situation is and weigh everything and so on. So that's the perspective that you would approach with a person who you know is reasonable. With a person who you don't think is necessarily reasonable, you, that's not, those aren't the strategies that I would adopt. And we can talk about those, but those are, you'd want to adopt some different strategies. Okay. So let's say that I'm not talking to somebody who I so, think is particularly reasonable. Let's, let's, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking to a flat earther right now. Oh. <laughs> what, what strategy would I use with them? Sure. Well, uh, let me give you an example of a conversation. I, also, I frequently have these conversations with conservative radio show hosts. So I had a conversation with Scott Sloan, who is a conservative radio show host who is well known in the secular community for having debated with Aaron Roth of, um, about the ARC debate, uh, mm -hmm. about Kentucky ARC. So he's well known in that. People, folks can look, look him up. Aaron Roth called him a conservative Christian, and he is a conservative. Mm. So I went on his radio show to discuss Muslims and terrorism. And as you can imagine, you know, not, he's not very hot on Muslims. <laughs> and, <laughs> no. uh, so I first I uh, figured out how I would approach him. I first validated his emotions. I said, you know, hey, I totally hear you, Scott. You know, it's very natural to have experiences of fear and anger toward Muslims. These are very natural things. We can I can definitely relate to that. But let's talk about what we want. We want safety and security, right? And this is not actually my primary goal. My primary goal in this case is civil rights. But I know that based on the research, conservatives tend to value safety and security more than civil rights. So I focused on a thing that we both share, that he cares more about than I. So I said, we both want uh, security, right? So let's see how we can get security. And this was a conversation in 2016. Uh, so I said in 2015, looking at the statistics, we had six Muslims commit terrorist attacks. And these are six Muslims out of 1.8 million adult Muslims in the U.S. That's a rate of one out of 300,000. You know, that's like take, finding a terrorist in several football fields. You know, not very <laughs> likely. Uh -huh. uh, you're you're going to get a lot of false positives. You're going to really waste your resources of safety and security and miss the real terrorists. So if you focus on persecuting Muslims, and this was a time when Donald Trump and Ted Cruz were talking about, you know, securing and policing Muslim communities. You're basically not going to make uh, us safer by doing that. Now, other problems with that is that the FBI said that it really values Muslim community cooperation and rooting out terrorists. And if you try to police and have persecute Muslim communities, they're not going to be very likely to cooperate with you. So they'll make you less safe. And finally, we already have Donald Trump uh, on um, being used by al Shabib to record terrorist uh, recruitment videos and so on. So you'll have even more of that if you start persecuting Muslim communities. So altogether, persecuting Muslims makes you less safe, not more safe. Even if you have fear and anger toward Muslims, you know, it, you're, in order to reach our mutual goals of safety and security, we should be tolerant toward Muslims and nice and kind to them instead of persecuting them just for the sake of our safety and security. And, you know, Scott agreed. He updated on that and he said, yes, kind of, that makes sense. You know, we should be tolerant toward Muslims, even if we, even if our emotions tell us that we should. So that's the strategy that you would want to approach when talking to conservatives. And I wrote about this on Patheos and elsewhere. 
you what you want to do is you want to create a shared sense of goals. So shared goals, uh, not simply a conservative, that's not right. Anyone who has a perspective on reality that you believe is irrational in some, you know, flat earthers, whatever. So uh, create a, set, a shared set of goals, then validate their emotions as real and valid, kind of, you know, in terms of, yes, they are your emotions and that's okay. So create emotional attunement because they tend to be emotionally oriented. You want to be emotionally in tune with them and then show them how their beliefs, their current perspective on reality actually contradicts the sh- goals that you both share and lead them through that process. So it's, it's a hard skill for people to be emotionally in tune with other, with other people. It's not comfortable. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. You know, I remember lots of arguments and debates I had when I was a kid when it was really fun to intellectually stump over, all over, you know, the jocks and, you know, to win those arguments and debates. Like, it's pleasurable, it's fun, it's enjoyable to have those conversations and to have those debates. But it's not going to get them to change their minds. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, and that's, and that's what I was thinking when, when you were talking about this. And I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you. I, I think you have a very valid point. But I'm, you know, I guess part of it is I'm a very short tempered kind of person. And it just, the idea of, uh, from, from my perspective, the idea of coddling somebody into not being a flat earther is just nauseating to me. I mean, it just, it just so, <laughs> I mean, I, I have to say, See things from their point of view. I'm like, I don't see things from your point of view. It's an idiotic idea. You're a fucking moron. I, you know, it just <laughs> drives me. And the idea, and yeah. I, I don't disagree with you. I, I think, I think you're, you're very right. But yeah, it's hard to do. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I don't no, know how still. I would do that with a flat earther or with a in anything else that's that defies yeah. rationality. I mean, I told I told you how I do it with someone who has, you know, irrational prejudice toward Muslims. Mm-hmm. You know, if you want to talk with an, let's say, anti-vaxxer, establish a shared connection about caring for kids and kids' health and so on, and be emotionally in tune with that person around kids' health. Like, you know, you both really care about kids' health, right? Like, that's the thing that you care about. And let's talk about how we get kids' health. Well, you know, here's the research on how you get kids' health with autism. Here's the research on how you get kids' health. You know, with vaccination, and here's the research on how you get kids health without vaccination. Let's let's figure out the best way that we can to make kids healthy because that's what we both care about: kids and their health, right? I mean, that's not how you. That is not the typical conversation between a person who is an anti-vaxxer and like a normal person. Normal person, <laughs> would, you know, would say like, "What are you dumb? Here's the research. Here's the yeah, science. That's, Stop that. That's me. Don't don't be dumb. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's." Like I said, it's fun and it's, you know, you feel good. <laughs> I feel good. You know, you can feel good about it, but it's not going to get them to change their mind. So actually, if you want to get them to change their mind, these are the three simple things to remember. Uh, shared goals, emotional attunement, and show them how orienting toward the truth of reality will help them achieve your shared goals. And I imagine what these were their deep set feelings that these people have or ideas they have. It's not going to be an immediate change with them to flip and, uh, and, and change their mind. It might be something that has to take some time and yep. maybe more people to reinforce the idea like, hey, maybe I am wrong. Sure. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So research on things like, let's say, uh, debiasing trainings. If you bring in, let's say, a diversity instructor for a group of people where you observe some prejudice. And uh, this is something frequently done by companies, so the, the diversity instruction. In the diversity instruction uh, meeting them s- itself, people have powerful experiences with people who have various forms of privilege and don't realize uh, how they may be unconsciously biased and slighting other people around them. They have powerful experiences, but that quickly fades. So if you get that powerful experience, you kind of open them up but unless you change, you have, you need to create some system of reminders. So I, like I said, uh, just because people know the Ten Commandments doesn't mean that they think about the Ten Commandments before they take the test. <laughs> so you need some kind of system of reminders and incentives and community support 
for them to really move toward change. And so that is an important aspect of the Pro-Truth Pledge project. How do you create a system, a community of people who are going to be oriented toward changing people's minds and helping them commit to truth-oriented behavior? Hi, this is Yvette Dontremont, a.k.a. The Cybabe, and you're listening to Godless Revolution. You can find me at Cybabe.com, at my Twitter account, at The Cybabe, and if you've hunt really hard, you can find me at Pornhub. I dare you. Please stand by. The Godless Revolution will continue in a moment. Here follows a public service announcement for the Two Skeptical Chaps podcast. (laughs) Greetings, Americans. Over here in London, we are well aware that not all of you are loud, xenophobic, racist, sexist, religious nuts. But many of your politicians who display these frightful traits seem to be quite popular. Particularly a certain wall-obsessed, small-handed, best word-using, daughter-perving, war-inciting, candy-floss-headed clown. To those of you who choose to follow such balderdash, we strongly recommend not to listen to the two sceptical chaps. It probably won't be your cup of tea. Otherwise, give us a listen. Each episode, we cover any news or current affairs from across the globe. Things that annoy or delight us. That's two, as in the number two. And sceptical with a K. The wrong way to spell it. Cheerio! Now, Preacher Custer here argues not only is there a God, he's going to call him down right into this room and we're all going to talk to him. Ain't that right, Preacher Custer? Something like that. You and the Godless Revolution will be reassimilated in three, two, one. You had mentioned that, you know, you, you went on the conservative show and and you mm-hmm. you reached mutual agreement. I've noticed that even a lot of the time when I can get somebody to mutually agree with me on something, I'll notice, you know, weeks or months or sometimes even just a matter of a few days later, I'll notice that they, that they're backsliding, that they start posting the same thing, you know, revealing Mm -hmm. that they still believe what we had discussed mutually and agreed on Mm -hmm. before. And and they've backslid now and they're promoting the same thing as if uh, the conversation we had never in fact even took place. And Mm -hmm. I seem to recall uh, reading or hearing something a while back where in order to fully adopt uh, information that conflicts with what you currently believe, you have to confirm it or, 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 you know, say that you believe it or, or be confronted with it a, a certain number of times before it really sinks in and you really truly adopt it. Have you, have you heard something similar or have any more information well, about that? Yeah, it's not. There's no magic number. Let me just be clear. It's not about a magic number of times before people are confronted. It's more a matter of incentives and reminders and the environment and social support. So these are the crucial factors that research shows are important. So what kind of incentives do people have to believe certain information? For example, if people, if a company takes diversity seriously, then and people get seriously penalized for showing you know various forms of bias then they will be less likely to show those forms of bias so and vice versa if they get rewarded for it so on and so on so one is incentives the other is social network effects the people around you are going to shape you powerfully now let's say you're around that one person who you influence in some way, and then other people influence that person, and then she started, you know, being more influenced by them. So the community is going to be really important. Community is really important. Then a sense of self-commitment. So did that person really internally commit to this new information? Uh, did it really match their goals to commit to this new information, or did they just say yes to placate you and stop arguing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's also a thing that people do. Um, and that's another situation. Another one is, is there, what kind of role models do they have? Do the role models who they equate themselves to and who they feel their identity to be similar to? Is that, are those role models showing behavior that, uh, is problematic or not? So they have a number of factors. There's not like, you know, any sort of magic number. There's a, going to be a number of, of things that influence people. 
So like I said, with the Pro Truth Pledge, that's a project that we're working on to try to influence people in a positive manner, truth-oriented manner. I don't, I have done a lot of research and evaluation of this stuff, and there's no uh, other group or organization or movement that's trying to do this, trying to get people to value the truth in a way that's really shown by research to be likely to work, to get people to value the truth. And so this is our aspiration, to get ordinary citizens to value the truth. So for ordinary citizens, us, they, for people who take the pledge, they commit to the behaviors of the pledge. So nobody is forcing their hands. They don't, you know, nobody's standing there and say, take the pledge. They're saying, <laughs> you know, hey, you want to take this? Sure, go ahead. It's up to you. If you're comfortable committing to these behaviors, please do it. So that's one. Second, then they get, if you click on, for those who are following along, if you're on the website at protruthpledge.org, you can go to the website that take the pledge, the orange form. And so you could see that there are a number of things that they can fill out. Uh, you know, name, last name, email, that's kind of basic. Then they can choose to sign up. They can, you know, um, we ask them to give their address if they choose to do so. And that's uh, the main purpose of that is so that we can tell their elected representatives, everyone from the district, you know, judge mm -hmm. to state senator, to congressperson, to, you know, to governor, to president about how many people have signed the pledge and who are their constituents. And then they can sign up for various things. They can sign up to say, I call on all of my elected representatives to take the pro-truth pledge. And that way it's, it functions as a petition. Then I want to be listed in the public database of people who signed the pro-truth pledge. And that, uh, so, the, and then they can provide that information. That offers people the opportunity to be part of a community of recognized people who are committed to the truth and to the 13 behaviors that are listed in the pro-truth pledge. They can sign up to email updates and action alerts. And those serve as reminders. So we talked about how important reminders are to get people to change their behaviors. So these are the reminders that help people change their behaviors. Now we don't remind them. We don't say, Hey, remember you, you know, you promised to, to stick to the pledge. We send kind of updates saying, Hey, this is how many new people took the pledge and this is what's going on. And here's a new resource, like a fact check engine, search engine that we compose just of credible sources, but it still functions as a reminder for them to be oriented toward the pledge. And then they can also help with the pro truth pledge, which means they become a part of a community of people who are oriented toward volunteering for the advancing the pro truth pledge, which is things like getting others to sign it, getting politicians and other public figures to sign it, getting ordinary people to sign it, evaluating and monitoring public figures like politicians and podcast show hosts and public commentators and bloggers and media figures who signed it and so on. So they join the community and they can also follow it on social media, which also helps create that reminder. So it's oriented toward using behavioral science strategies to create reminders and create a new social norm, a community of people who are oriented toward the truth and whose words they can trust. So anyone who signs the pledge and will, wants to help is welcome to join some internal Facebook groups that are otherwise private, only that are only for people who want to help with the pledge. So here are some of the things that are meant to help people who join the community of pro-truth pledge signers to actually stick by them. You need to have some kind of like little badge that like blogs and websites could like put on their their website to say I I took the I I follow the pro truth pledge. So if you go on the blog page, so oh, it's going to, yep. If if you go on the blog page, it's going to be the second block down the pro truth pledge website badge. Oh, there you are. Uh, oh, well, there you go. I think that if you go to Aaron Ra's website. It's going to be on his website at erinrod.org. So, yeah, and other people who took the approach with Pledge for public figures. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah. He's already on top of it. Oh, yeah, apparently. <laughs> hey, I'm, I, I'm, I, always, I'm always coming up with the idea second. So. Okay. I like ideas. <laughs> Such is my life. <laughs> These are ideas. So, so that's, yeah, that's for private citizens. Now, you, you mentioned a couple things that could help just to, to 
that helps serve people when they're backsliding or when they, you know, are, are seeking reinforcement of their ideas. And a couple of those that you mentioned were the community that they're in and then their leaders or role models that they look up to. And of course, instantly that what pops into my mind when talking about people who are, you know, against the truth and, <laughs> and, and, you know, backslide routinely and, and there's really no way to get through to them or it seems nearly impossible are Trump supporters and, and people who believe the things that the orange menace in the White House <laughs> is, is telling them. So, yeah. so with, you know, with those two, huge factors about, you know, what will help somebody to change their mind or, or continue on, on their way of thinking. How do we penetrate both the community and their, their belief that Donald Trump is somebody to look at as a role model? Yeah. So that's a very dangerous tendency where that's the kind of things that leads to authoritarianism and it led to authoritarianism in a number of countries. Turkey is going into that process from a former democracy into an authoritarian state as a result of lies by its leader and the leader presenting himself as the single voice of truth. Russia went through the process about just under a decade ago. Then um, Spain, Portugal, Germany, Italy went through that process and certainly don't want to, that to happen in the U.S. It's quite dangerous. So the leader is fortunately only one out of several factors that get people to think that that's the way they should be. And we can influence the other things. Then that's the great thing. We can influence. We can influence their community. We can influence what goals and ideals they commit to. We can influence uh, whether they choose to focus what they're primed with, what they're reminded by. We can't really influence their leader, but okay, we can influence other things. So let's work on what's workable and let's do what's doable, right? <laughs> you know, I uh, we have um, a volunteer who went to present in a Rotary Club here. Now, Rotary Clubs, uh, well, uh, I, I really don't like presenting at Rotary Clubs because they have a prayer before you present. And they're, <laughs> yeah, for those who don't present. So they have a prayer, but anyway, they tend to be uh, Christian-leaning. They, I mean, Christian, they tend to be christian they tend to be somewhat conservative. And this was in a red district of the area. So it's a red-leaning organization in a red-leaning district. Now, she went there, she gave a presentation about the Pro-Truth Pledge, and she got 25% of the membership to sign up, which is, you know, great. You know, you get conservatives to sign up for the Pro-Truth Pledge. That's wonderful. Yeah. So let's, let's do more of that. You know, if they sign up to the Pro-Truth Pledge, then they already took, made a commitment to join to these uh, values and to orient toward these values, and they're going to be contradictory to the behavior of the orange menace. So if they're contradictory <laughs> to the behavior of the orange menace, they are less likely to support, you know, financially or with their votes, people who support like people like Donald Trump. And this goes, you know, this is a nonpartisan project. You know, if we have lying Democrats, this goes the same way. So people who blind Democrats are less likely to be supported by this by people who signed the pro truth pledge as well. It's all about the truth, whichever side it happens to come from. So, so oh, yeah. go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, so I was going to ask him, following on to, on to Dan's question a little bit. One of the things I've noticed, and and this is just observational. So, tell me if 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 you've seen this in in actual research, is that People who, who tend to believe in alternative facts and in their own truth and, and, uh, are not being that rational. Uh, a lot of some, at least sometimes, if not a lot of times, are doing it based on pure self interest. It's, you know, they believe the facts that, that speak to their own personal self interest, regardless of, of what they're actually seeing. Then, yes. then people like Trump come along and, and, uh, suck onto that. You know, I, so the coal industry is, is a great example. You know, uh, the coal is dying. The coal miners are out of work. They want to have jobs. Um, and, and so they're only believing the facts relative to, uh, the dying coal industry while ignoring all the actual truth, uh, about the coal industry. And then yeah. Trump comes along and says, "Yeah, I'm going to get you your jobs back," and and they just latch onto that. Uh, how sure. do how do you fight that? 
how do you fight against somebody's own self interest when when yeah, the I, truth uh, is contradictory to to what's in what what benefits them? Yeah, so you need to find the language that speaks to them. I think with coal miners, uh, let, let's take that example. You want to say that hey, you know. This, your situation sucks. You know, this coal mining has been going and, you know, it's been going away and it's really bad that this situation is going on. People are upset at coal mining. You know, the damn environmentalists are trying to, you know, take your jobs. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I know. Yeah. No, I, I know. know. Uh, you know, you empathize with them and say, well, uh, let's, let's see what we can do to actually help you achieve your financial goals. Let's look at the numbers. Let's, you know, you want to be serious about this. Let's, let's stick with the numbers because, you know, we both all want you to have a job and to have safety for your family and, you know, care and so on. So that stuff. Then you say, well, looking at the numbers, it's pretty clear that coal will not come back. Whatever Donald Trump t- tries to do, it's so unfortunate. Wow, this really sucks. Well, what can we do if coal is not coming back? Well, we can do thing X and thing Y and get you re- retraining and so on. So let's focus on these things. Let's focus on being realistic and like not hope for things that aren't unrealistic because of, you know, those damn environmentalists and so on. <laughs> uh, and then that's the way you get them to update toward shared aspirations. And But I've got all these photo mat franchises and that I want to bring back. I mean, I can make a whole bunch of money processing film, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... I suggest I suggest you try making America great again. <laughs> bring, bring, bring back that, film. Yes. That's that's bring when back. America was great when you could drive through to a photo mat and have your eight your yeah. eight millimeter develop. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, so that's uh, what you basically again same principle. You empathize with people. You sh- you find a shared sense of common goals, and you help them feel that you're on their side, and then you lead them toward an accurate view of reality. Will it work every time? No. I mean, some people will not be reachable, but some people will be. So you work with the reachable people. You know, Hillary Clinton, I think, said it well, that like half of Trump supporters aren't the deplorables past. We don't need to reach them all. <laughs> we yeah. don't. Yeah. No, and we can't, and that's fine. Let's reach the reachable ones. When we did the presentation at the Rotary Club, 25% of people signed up. Now, what will happen if, you know, hypothetically speaking, 25% of Trump supporters vote the other way? I mean, that's, that's huge. Yeah. But that makes the whole difference. So those people are reachable. And this is, the pledge is meant to reach them. And part of the pledge is also to get public figures to commit to. So we have a whole different, you know, a related process that's oriented toward public figures because we figure that, you know, ordinary citizens would take it who care about truth. And we have conservatives and liberals alike who care about truth. So we can get those people on board by bringing it to their attention and showing them how it will help our society orient toward the truth and reverse the tide of lies. So that's good. Now, how do we get public figures to take? Because they actually get, their actions are restricted when they take it in concrete ways. They, so we were thinking about this for a while and we looked at what succeeded in the environmental movement for them to induce political figures and other public figures to be more environmentally friendly. And what happened with that movement is that basically reputational rewards and punishments turned out to be really effective. So reputational rewards and punishments is what we decided to go for. So on the same page, if you go to, you know, I take the pledge, you can see that public figures have an opportunity to say, are you a public figure? or staff of the public figure, official, or so on. And then if they're a public figure, again, anyone from local district judge and local newspaper reporter, podcast show host, radio show host, uh, local politician, all the way up to you know, president, Supreme Court judge, whatever. If they're a public figure, they can put in a paragraph about why they chose to sign the pledge and give free links to their online media presence. So, you know, things like uh, their campaign contribution page for a politician and their website and their Twitter or something like that, or Patreon page and web blog page for a blogger or, you know, speaker page or whatever for a podcast show host and Patreon and so on, however they, they make money. And that gets sent out 
which is another big reason why we want as many people to sign up, especially for the email updates, then get sent out in a monthly email update to all the people who signed up for email updates. Now that gives people a nice reputational reward for committing to the pledge. Because if you think of, let's say, a blogger who uh, sends this around to all the people who took the pledge, now that blogger is going to be quite a bit more likely to have a following, a bigger following than the next blogger who didn't take the Pro Truth pledge, because that blogger will be more credible, be seen as more credible, and they can put on their website that they took the Pro Truth pledge, or and they can also get more of an audience among the people who already took the Pro Truth pledge and who will be more likely to listen to. Uh, you know, a more credible podcast or read a more credible blogger who took the pro truth pledge. So that is a big advantage in terms of incentive, reputational incentive and reward. In fact, we have podcast hosts who start their every podcast by saying, Hey, I took the pro truth pledge and, you know, I hold me accountable, call me out if anything I say is incorrect. Now that gives them quite a bit more credibility than another podcaster who doesn't do that. Because again, they, it shows that they, their words are credible and they're being held accountable. And they also have a track record. They are listed on the website in a public database as people who took the approach of pledge. So it gives them a lot of credibility in, through taking that pledge. So what kind of response have you gotten from public figures? Oh, I mean, there are a number of prominent. So people right now, we're only bringing it to uh, people we anticipate would be early adopters. So the secular reason oriented community, I've gotten quite a good lot of support. So people like, you know, the podcast shows host that you mm-hmm. shared about earlier, people like Aaron Ra of the Raman, No Legends of the Scathing Atheist, um, Thomas Smith of Serious Inquiries Only, uh, By Any Means, uh, Trav Mamon, then the Inciting Incident Podcast, and Sensibly Speaking, Dentropology. Oh, I can the unbuckling the Bible Belt podcast, and I yeah. can go on and on. So have, people, have you have you tried to reach out to politicians? Yes, we've reached out to politicians who we anticipated would be early adopters, who we think are already oriented toward reason. We got a number of them to sign the pledge. Oh, nice. So, for example, um, you know, I live in Columbus, Ohio, and we have a number of volunteers here as part of Intentional Insights. So, we've been really focusing on this as a test ground. In fact, just today earlier. I finished half an hour before a phone call. We had a training on doing tabling of, and uh, in-person pitching because the March for Truth is coming up on June 3rd, and we have a number of speakers in that, so in Columbus and in uh, some other cities. So we were talking, you know, doing training. We had something like seven people here in the house and something like also seven people watching on a video from around the country about how to do tabling and how to do in-person pitching. So, yeah, we had some good responses. We have something like, at this point, maybe 10 politicians signed up. I believe that's around the number, including something like three or four here in Columbus. And uh, we are going to others. So right now we are trying to pick the low-hanging fruits and then going on to more high-hanging fruits. Yeah. So that's the strategy that we're done. Our, net- our aspiration is to build a network of supporters throughout the country who can do this sort of promotion in every city in the United States and then to Canada and beyond. <laughs> I, I can think of one local politician who would probably do this. Unfortunately, I can only think of one. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> think of, you know, one is better than none, I always say. <laughs> <That's true. Yeah. laughs> <laughs> I think no I, I think this is I think this is a wonderful yeah. and and worthy and lofty goal and and I I think all three of us would be happy to take the pledge. Yeah. Um I'm so excited to hear that. Yeah, going back to something that you mentioned a little bit ago, uh, you said that we need to reach the reachable. Yeah, how do we how, how do we how do we know or at what point can we decide that somebody is not reachable? Like when do we when do we abandon our efforts with somebody who just it's it's not worth our time or energy? At, at what point can we determine that that person is not reachable? Yeah, the, great question. So we have on our website intentionalinsights.org. Uh, if folks go to it, guide for talking to rational people, whispering to the elephant. It's published on May twenty second, twenty seventeen. So not too long ago. 
And it's uh, something like a 6,000 word piece by a former U.S. intelligence agent, mm. uh, which talks about how do you effectively reach people and how do you determine that they are unreachable and kind of all the strategies, a lot of really useful strategies that folks can use. So I'd uh, refer them to this guide. It's a very pretty easy guide and it goes through all the things you want to. Um, I find that if the, if people just want an easy heuristic, like a very easy shortcut, it's good to show that other person the pro-truth pledge. Say, I signed the pro-truth pledge. Do you want to sign the pro-truth pledge? And then we can have a conversation on the basis of this pro-truth pledge. So that can be a very, very easy filter for people with how, you know, do you want to waste your time with this person if she or he is not going to be willing to abide by the behaviors of the pro-truth pledge? Probably not. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like why, why spend your valuable time with that person? Unless you're deliberately trying to use the strategies that I described earlier to get to this person, that's totally justifiable. I totally understand why you would want to do that and get them to update and change their mind. But if you're not engaged in a serious effort to change the mind of someone in a deliberate manner, using the pro-truth pledge as a filter is quite good as a strategy. Yeah, I think it's also a great strategy for building uh, the power and influence of the of the pledge. I mean, if you are encountering somebody and you say, I've, I've taken the pro-truth pledge, would you do the same? And then we can have a dialogue about whatever you want to talk about. I think that's a great way to both grow the movement and provide accountability for people in those conversations and for determining whether those conversations are even worth having with somebody. I like that. That's a good point. No, I think that's, that's very fair. Yeah. That's a good uh, strategy for growing the movement as well. Well, you have been incredibly generous with your time with us tonight. I appreciate it very much. This is, this has been a fun, uh, a bunch of fantastic information. Yeah. Um, I need to go out and read all of the stuff on your website. I, this oh, is wonderful. <laughs> this, this is amazing. Yeah. And I think we will absolutely, uh, sign up and take the pro-truth pledge and, and start promoting that as well. Excellent. And remember to uh, mark the general public figures and provide a blurb about why you took the pledge and link your podcast and anything else, any other two venues, if you have a Patreon page or anything like that, link those. Certainly will. So how can people get in touch with you if they have uh, questions for you or want more information? So for me personally, they can email me at gleb, G-L-E-B, at intentionalinsights.org. That's my email, gleb at intentionalinsights.org. They can find me on Facebook at Gleb Sapursky. So Gleb, G-L-E-B, Sapursky, T-S-I-P-U-R-S-K-Y. They can go to intentionalinsights.org for the nonprofit that I run that has the articles on thinking more rationally and conversing with rational people and so on. And that's, again, intentional insights. And finally, again, strongly encourage everyone to go to protruthpledge.org and sign up to fight the tide of lies in our society and advance the truth. Well, Gleb Sapersky, thank you so much for your yeah. time. And we're, we're absolutely delighted to have you on the show. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure, Dan, Ryan, and Grant, to be on the show. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Hello, I'm Lloyd Evans. I'm a former Jehovah's Witness. I'm the author of The Reluctant Apostate and senior editor of JWSurvey.org. And you are listening to The Godless Revolution. What I say, my position in all of this is that preacher Custer, like every single preacher, priest, and holy man since the dawn of time, is full of shit. Thank you to everybody who has rated the show on iTunes and Stitcher and are following us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And to all our Patreon patrons, you make the show possible. Well, that was a great interview, man. He's a really interesting dude. Yeah, yeah. no doubt. I dig his accent. Too. Oh, you know what? We forgot to have him say oh, <laughs> nuclear <laughs> vessel. Oh, we were going to do it. I forgot. Damn it. <laughs> well, every, to... every Russian I meet, I ask him to say nuclear vessel. They all look at me funny like, why? Well, you should, you should start with, are you a Star Trek fan? Or, well, yeah. <laughs> should start with that. Do you, do you know what, do you know what this, like, you, you don't want to insult him, right? But, <laughs> no. but. No, that was awesome. Yeah. I, I think that I think the whole truth pledge thing is fantastic, and it, no. and it's it's kind of a, a self promoting thing, right? Yeah. The the more people who sign up, the yeah. more people who want to sign up to lend credibility to themselves and what 
what they're saying. And, well, and it seems so much more beneficial to society, not just to society, but you know, to politics and to, to everything, than than say like Rover Norquist's no new taxes pledge. Yeah, I and mean, that's you know he has his own goals and all that. Whatever, I I don't know, but this this seems a like a whole a whole lot more beneficial to the the foundation of society and democracy. Well, also just helping conversations. Yeah, yeah. Well, it helps, like you said, it's beneficial to society and community. I mean, it, it's if you if you have no truth to stand on, what the fuck are you are you even conversing about? If you can't agree on the basics of Simple what basic is facts. true, yeah, like the color of the sky, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and you would ha- and you and I, I'm sure, have had conversations with people who would fucking tell us that the sky was a different color, yeah. if it suited their purposes, yeah, yeah. So well, I even I even called Grant out like last summer on something you posted. I remember probably. And the the, the only thing I asked was, "Hey, is there another source for this?" And you're like, and, oh. well, and I've I've made that mistake. Yeah. I I have made that mistake. I posted things too quickly. I've tried to learn from that, and and yeah. now I, I, I try think, to. Yeah, know, we we've all done it where we see something yeah. like, "Oh, this is incredible." You post but it I'm, out, then you later on someone points out like, "Oh, hey, by the way." That's not true. Yeah. This yeah. is here's what's and actually, I am it's like, ah, very ah, willing to retract, uh, yeah, know, delete anything that's untrue. Or I, I have no problem admitting fault when when I make that mistake. Oh crap! You know, one of the questions that I was going to ask you now that you mentioned that is, the let's say you make a post somewhere and you're you find out later that it is incorrect. Oh, is it better to leave it up and to apologize. leave it up and and you know post comments in there and maybe even change the the initial own, post to say i know this is wrong or whatever or do you just remove it yeah oh shit i yeah well, that would be a good question to ask my my thought process and that would be is if you put it up then you put an edit note in there saying edit you know hey after further reading and research i have discovered that this article is not truthful yeah. now other people will see that oh wait someone did the research on this and they found that this is not truthful maybe i shouldn't post that out as well yeah well and i would i would tend to agree that you should just edit the thing that was out there and, and leave it up so people other people receive this warning that, hey, don't share this because it's false. But at the same time, I have done that in the past and seen other people do that. And then even after they have done that, you'll see some dumb asshole comment on their post after they have, you know, made this change to it or whatever. And all this person reads, they don't even read the original post or comments about it. They look at the headline of a news article or whatever was posted and then make their own shitty, stupid comment. Totally verifying that they didn't read the 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 edited post. They didn't read the article. They read the headline and they're running with it and they're sharing it with other people. I guess you just need to do your edit in all caps. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, well, and then I guess too, you can go back and if you see people doing that on your post or on somebody else's post, just type out a quick little comment to reply yeah. to them and say, "Hey, man, you know this is this is wrong." They've corrected the post. You may want to yeah. Instead of attacking double check them, this or fix yours. Yeah. yeah. Instead of attacking them, be like, hey, dipshit, read the fucking headline <laughs> of the post. Be like, hey, you know, in case you didn't notice, they corrected themselves on this. And but said, I yeah. enjoy attacking <laughs> and And try to do it kindly and say, yeah. hey, man, I, I saw your comment here. I don't know if you noticed they, that they've corrected this to say that it isn't correct. And well, I even you may had... want to fix yours if you've shared it or whatever. My uh, my my dumb Christian friend on Facebook posted this whole thing out about fucking liberals doing this and that, and you can't even buy the Dukes of Hazard on fucking on uh on Amazon anymore because it's got the Confederate flag in it, but yet you can buy a fucking <laughs> Nazi SS flag. So I go in and I make two two comments of screenshots of of a uh, uh of fucking Amazon huh. one where the whole collection of Dukes of Hazard is for sale. Mm. And one where I go through the first three pages and can't find a fucking Nazi flag. (laughs) And he goes, well, I was referring to the Confederate flag. Then I post on there like, here's a Confederate flag for sale on Amazon. Yeah, but it's not prime. (laughs) That's what he said. I'm like, I'm just going to keep moving these gold. It's still (laughs) fucking sale. (laughs) Yeah. And how do you get people to it? I mean, I think that's the problem is that people don't like to admit when they're wrong. I don't, I don't mind. I think people shouldn't mind when admitting when they're wrong. It means that you've learned something. I'm even more mindful to, to say it out loud. If I'm like talking with someone at work and they can point out where I'm wrong, I'm more mindful to say, Hey, you're right. I was wrong on that. I don't, I don't like being wrong. It's, it's embarrassing. It's, it's uncomfortable, 
But but I learned something from yeah. it. And I don't make that fucking mistake again, you know? Well, yeah, and I, I can see that it would be embarrassing for somebody. But I think, I don't know, maybe I just place more value on it being that I've learned something versus being embarrassed by thinking something wrong in the first place. Yeah. yeah. And, and especially, you know, as an atheist who had some, you know, at least moderate religious beliefs when I was younger or a whole bunch of other really ridiculous beliefs that I've since changed. Like the I'm ribs. proud of that. I'm proud that I have changed my mind mm-hmm. on these things and that I was wrong about these things before. And I can say I was wrong and that I'm proud that I've changed my mind on them. And I don't know why more people can't be more proud that they would discover the truth and acknowledge that they were wrong about something than, than, than having their embarrassment trump all of that. That seems completely backward to me. Like, why would you want to continue going on believing something incorrect? It's, it's, you should be proud of the fact that your thought process has progressed. And yeah. You've matured in your, your thinking. Yeah. And you've learned something. You've yeah. become a better person because you've learned some new information. And you might have learned how to be more observant and being like, hey, well, I've been, I've, fell, I've fallen for this so many times already. I'm not going to fall for it again. Yeah. No matter what situation it is. Yeah. And how many times have we, how many, <laughs> how many relationships have I had where I've said, I will never let this happen again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nobody's going to treat me like this again. Oh boy, I'll tell you that. And then they do. And then they do. <laughs> and you let it happen. But I don't know. But I mean, Everybody's messy. Everybody has different things they're a yeah. little bit weird or strange about. But like I said, I I don't mind admitting when I'm wrong because it it means that I've learned something. I've advanced. I've grown. And when other people can't admit that they're wrong, I just I don't know. I, I look at them as as stagnating, as being completely com- being completely fine with where they are in life. That they that they don't feel they need to learn anything else. And if you don't, yeah. if you feel like you don't need to learn anything else, then why the fuck are you interacting with people in the first place? Well, and not to mention, I mean, completely and totally dishonest with themselves and with everyone else. I mean, right. the, nobody goes through life without learning life lessons. Failing, being unable to admit to it, okay, that's that's a whole separate thing. But these people who, who say they never make a mistake or, or they've never been wrong or whatever, yes, they have been. They're, they're just refusing to accept it or mm-hmm. admit it, mm-hmm. but they have. And and they've learned something from it at some point. Yeah. Since the day of their birth, they've learned not to put the hand on the stove, or <laughs> you know, I mean, they've learned something in their lives. Yeah. Well, should we move on to some other items of interest? Sure. Sure. Yeah. I am Jim Helton, regional director for American Atheists and president of the Tri-State Freethinkers, and you're listening to Godless Revolution. The only true God. The only real God is the God of meat. Thanks for listening. Now back to the show. You can put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. Well, it's been a little while. It has. But we have... A basket, or someone to put in the, the basket of deplorables. Yay. I fucked that up. <laughs> you, you need, like, a sound effect. I do. You, know? you need, like, you know, an echo thing or, you know, something. I think I have a clip from Hillary Clinton that I've been playing before. For, before the- Oh, have you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, think, I think that's what I've been doing. Feels like it's been a while since it, it, you've it had has. a new edition. When, what, I think, well, I've got the list here. Was it episode one? Forty. Yeah, so it's been okay. nineteen episodes since we've done it. Okay, because Ryan's been a, a slacker. Hey, I'm a forgetter. <laughs> but we have somebody to throw in the basket this evening. Yes, and who? That's a ding. That's a, that's a ding on the uh, Facebook. Sorry, everybody. Um, well, it was it was one of our awesome listeners, Brandy Hamrick, that sent it into us. Oh, okay. well, she's actually she tagged me on Facebook with it and said, "Tagged you." Well, yeah, and said, hey, <laughs> this person should go in the basket. And I'm like, she's in. Nice. So should we set the scene or just let them listen to what this? No, set the scene for us. Okay, so this is taking place in a Walmart aisle uh, near the uh, pharmacy. And uh, apparently a Hispanic lady was trying to reach over and grab some medicine off of the shelf. And 
a Caucasian elderly, not elderly, older lady said, oh, uh, yeah. looks like she's in her fifties at least. Yeah, get yeah. Her yeah. Basically said, go fuck yourself. And I'm a racist piece of shit. So I win. <laughs> well, this should be exciting. <laughs> Run your mouth. Go back to Listen, Mexico. Listen, I said, I said, excuse go, me. Go back. Wherever you're from. I said, excuse me. Don't be rude. Well, you're the one that's rude. No, I said, yes, excuse me. I'm trying to buy you're something. You're in America. So? You're in America. So? So are what? That's right none here? of your business. Stay out of it. I don't need to stay out of it. I out said, excuse me. for everybody to hear. Stop being ignorant. Stop being ignorant. And then the look on that lady's face, like, you just called me what? <laughs> I don't know what that word actually means, but I'm going to go off on your ass. I love what's about to come next. Yeah. A nigger's calling me ignorant? Oh, yes. A my good. What did she just She just said she exactly just said, what you think she said. She, yes. Did she use the N-word? I was, yes, she yep, used the I was only like half paying attention. I'm going to back that up a little bit here. An N-word just called me ignorant. Whoa. Oh man! Let you, right. let you know that she knows the exact meaning of what ignorant is. Oh, jeez! A nigger's calling me ignorant. Oh, yes! My goodness! Wow! Oh my goodness! You are you are yes. very rude. No, you're the one that's rude. I said, excuse me, because I'm I'm trying to grab my medicine. You told me. You know what you told me, and I yes, I said, I said if you don't like Just me, I'm sorry. On. Just go on. Just go on. Get Whatever. Get out of here. No, I'm and not going to get out of Mexico. here. No. No, I'm not. Because this is my country. Argue? Yes, this is my country. country. Oh, yes, it is. No, no. We don't oh, like yes, it here. is. I we don't, don't care. like you here. We, uh, who does this? Does this bitch have a fucking frog in her pocket? <sighs> <sighs> what What state was this in? Uh, I, don't I don't remember if it had the state in the description or not. I don't see it in the description. No, just pushing a shopping cart into Walmart. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, it doesn't say where it is. Huh. Let's just watch the rest of it. We don't want you I here. don't care what you want or not. We no. don't want you here. Leave me That's alone. True. No. Yes. How rude. rude. How rude. I love how she's saying rude. Rude. <laughs> how rude. And this other male voice you hear stepping in is a uh, Walmart employee at oh, this awesome. point. Is he going to? I hope he kicks this. And, and he's like seven feet tall. Oh yeah, <laughs> nice. No ma'am, this, 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 this is inappropriate. <laughs> Thank you, her. For, yeah, for, tell her. No, no ma'am. Oh. Tell her. It's inappropriate. I said, excuse me. Speak for the store. I'm not here for the store. You're in the store. I'm spending money in the store. Correct. So am I. That doesn't give you any we'll fucking through. right to treat people like shit. Or, or even to be in the store. Yeah. No, yeah. Oh, and she mentioned this a, a couple of times about her rights. Yeah. And, and no, you don't have a right to be in Walmart. Technically, Walmart is private property. Yeah, it's private property. They want to kick you out. They can kick you out. It doesn't yep. matter if you're shopping there. If you're a shopper, you spend money or before or whatever. You don't have some constitutional right to be in the store. Nope. No. I'm spending money in the store. Correct. So am I. That's correct. Uh huh. So we're both Please customers. go. Please oh. go. Get out of here. She needs to grab one of those please, bottles please. of Tums please. and just Shut down up. it to settle all the whatever indigestion she's <laughs> suffering right now because her acid reflux, because she's obviously like, you know, something's affecting her. They need a, tr a rage pill. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are you... Does she honestly still have a right to no, be here? Okay. I am going to have to ask you to leave. This is inappropriate. It's not my fault. She started it. I did not do anything. I said you're going to make her shit. leave too? Well, you're just causing a scene in the store. I'm not. She is. By no, what? I did did not. you watch it? No. You weren't even I, I heard you from she the office. She is. That's because she was mouthing me. No, I said, excuse me. So don't tell me it's my fault. And you said, every time I'm on an aisle, People just come near I wasn't me. Talking to you, and I said, but "I'm you sorry." Made it your business. I said, "I'm sorry if you don't like it. I she need did. to get my medicine." She's it all up. No, I'm Every not. Wow. Just get your stuff and go. Oh, She's shopping as well. Oh my gosh. She has I every right too. to be here as you. And I'm not gonna listen to her mouth. 
we don't have to listen to her. But she's still I here do. and has she's every right do, 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 to do, 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 do. Which is what you're doing as well, ma'am. I'm just trying to resolve a conflict here, that's all. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. That's exactly what I'm trying the to do. The conflict is her. I did not do anything and to you, ma'am. You push your like car you towards me and pushed Nobody. me. I didn't push you. Yes, you pushed me with you. your cart. Oh, whatever. <laughs> I ain't listening to this whole crap. The, the restraint of the Walmart employee is, is admirable. But, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I'd kind of be at a point where just get the fuck out. Yeah, get the I, fuck out of the store, lady. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd be tempted to grab her cart and walk it back over to the aisles where everything was and just start putting it back on the shelf. Like, no, you're, you're done. You're not buying this because you're kicked out. And if you yeah. like the cops to come here and escort you out, we'll fucking gladly call them for you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think. He exercised maybe too much restraint. Too much. I, yeah. I, I would have said, "No, you're done. Get the fuck out of the store." And yeah. I think we're some, not going to put up with that shit here. Some of that comes from the fact that there have been Walmart employees fired for actually taking action. Yeah, that's true. There. there was the one last year, the guy that uh, uh, someone had like pulled a gun in Walmart and he had tackled him, and the dude was fired. He's like, "Hey, you're not supposed to be take action or violence against." Like the guy pulled a gun, hmm. and you tackled his ass. I've not heard of this. I've heard. Yeah, of this was about. It's probably about a year ago when the guy. Hmm. I did hear a follow up on this. I I don't have a reference, um, but I I heard that Walmart is trying. They haven't tracked down who this woman is yet. Okay. Uh, the older woman. The, the um, but they're they're trying to track her down so that they can ban her for life. Oh wow! They they want to ban her for life from Walmart. Wasn't wasn't that what happened in uh, the one where was it was it Target or Shopco, where they were in line? The lady I don't was, remember. It's it's it, it happening happened so, so it, much. It I can't even keep track anymore. Where the, the they basically the lady was kept going off and she was surprised. Like, no, you're well, you're that, kicked out. You're banned. That you're Starbucks not buying lady was banned, wasn't she? Well, and, I mean Starbucks from like twelve months ago, a year ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, and off to the side, you know, all of the related stories were. I mean, there's just video after video of. Racist white woman at IHOP, racist woman in JCPenney, white Walmart employee versus black customer, racist store owner follows a black guy. I mean, just it's just a ton of this shit now. It's yeah. all over the place. Welcome to Trump mania. Yeah. Trump's America. Trumplandia. Yeah. But also, I mean, we also welcome to an America where everything you do is going to be on camera. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thankfully, I mean, to help defend these people later. And, and and that's one of those things where I've, you know, thought about, like, it's, you know, and violence isn't on a rise. Racist actions aren't on a rise. It's just the fact that now there's cameras everywhere and people know to pull their camera out and start recording it when it happens so we see it more often. Yeah. Oh, I think it is on the rise, though. But, I mean, yeah, does, yeah. It, does it, does, I guess, does it really even help, though? I mean, the the people who are on this woman's side, I mean, are are they going to look at this video? The people in the Midwest or, you know, where wherever, the Deep South, are they going to look at this video and say, oh, well, I've changed my mind. No. Oh, that's just wrong. You know, I mean, you know, they fucking hate Mexicans anyway. Or they hate blacks or they hate whatever they hate because whoever it is is the cause of all their problems rather than, you know, someone else or politicians or themselves. So, you know, is this even going to change anyone's mind or is it just going to reaffirm their own beliefs and inflame people who already disagree with? Well, I would I would imagine that if it doesn't change their mind, at least it will make them think twice before they open their ignorant fucking mouth. True. Well, then we had the incident in Oregon on Saturday. I don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, you don't know what I'm talking about? No. The one where the guy was on the bus and he was harassing two African American women, one wearing a hijab, and two other guys stepped in to stop him, say, Hey, you know, cut it out. That's not appropriate. Oh, yes. And oh, he slit stabbing. their throats. This yeah. Yeah, that guy was seemed like a real peach. Well, he was in court yesterday. Oh yeah? Uh he said, I'm probably gonna get it wrong, but he came in there and said, uh uh you know, you all hate free speech. Uh, like, uh, 
basically came in there with no remorse and he set them along the line that this is what this is what patriotism looks like. Oh. Uh, okay. Murdering oh, and, murdering people. And that they should all die. Wow. And this was him, they walked him in, you know, he's escorted, he's in a little bulletproof box, and he screams these things out right off the bat. Oh jeez. Yeah. Oh jeez, that guy needs some help, eh? He he really does. One well, and Trump Trump came out against the organ stabbings, but it was the Three weakest four... weakest goddamn yeah. uh you know uh, thing against I do not that, condone that, violence. Just yeah, I mean it's like that that thing he did uh before he was elected where he just looks at the camera and just says, Stop it. Yeah. Stop it. You know, because that's that's <laughs> <laughs> Which is all he has to fucking say. Just, you know, just don't do it anymore, okay? Please, come on, please, guys. come on, guys. Which Can't we all just get along? Yeah. And at the same time, uh, I saw a bunch of people posting on Facebook saying Donald Trump does not condone violence. How could you say that? I'm like, I felt like going back through and finding all of his speeches where he says, you know, punch him. I could kill that person. Oh yeah, I could stand you know, in the middle of the street and shoot yeah. somebody. If, if you knock him out, I'll pay your lawyer fees. Yeah. I'm like, how is that not condoning violence? Well, and some of that shit's still winding its way through the court, too. Yeah. And the court hasn't absolutely definitively said that everything Trump said is not a, an incitement of violence. Well, there was, uh, so the, fa- uh, the, the, the riots in Boston, no, not Boston, uh, the one was last year after the African American was shot in the street, the father that got arrested for inciting a riot. I'm not sure where. Uh, it was, uh, Baltimore. Uh, after they did, did the whole thing at the court and they say, nope, there aren't pressing charges on them. And they held the thing on the street and the father got up on top of a car and was talking to the audience and they charged him with inciting a riot, Hmm. which is already going to happen anyways. He didn't, he didn't incite it. No, it was, it was, it was, you know, there was that many people pissed off and gathered already. It was going to happen. Yeah. People just don't listen to anybody anymore. Nope. They just talk past each other. It's, it's this desire to be right about everything. And I don't know what to do about it. Like when, when people come at me like that, like they won't listen to what I have to say. They don't ask questions. They make assumptions. They just start leaping to conclusions, pointing the finger, calling your names, whatever. And for people like that, I just, I've lately, I've just decided I'm not going to waste my fucking time. Yeah. Like, okay. You're not even asking me why I did something or. What I mean by saying this, you're jumping to a conclusion that you're painting me as a horrible person when you don't fucking know the facts of what's going on here. And if you have that, that little regard for anything I say or do or me as a person personally, then I don't have fucking time for you and you're just gone. Well, I'm not going to put up with that shit. And that's the issue with Facebook. Yeah. If you were having that conversation face to face at a coffee chat or something. I, well, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. They wouldn't, even, they wouldn't jump to those no. conclusions initially. They would ask me a question. Yeah, because they're face to face with you, and they don't have the option of just, "Well, I'm just going to type with this and ha, I win." Yeah, and there. I mean, it's been a little while, uh, but I don't know. Two or three months ago, there were a couple people that I just unfriended and blocked because I posted something, and they immediately started jumping my shit about it without asking me any questions, without saying anything to me about it, just. Well, you're saying that, like, put, telling me what I think about something without asking me what I think about yeah. it. And then when I make, you know, when I point that out and saying, look, maybe you should ask me rather than just telling me what I think and making these assumptions. And then they kept going down that line. And I'm like, okay, even when I try to point out what you're doing and that you're possibly wrong here, you're continuing with this line of shit where you seem to have this view that I must be this terrible person. So why would I waste my time having you as a friend yeah. if, or, you know, a Facebook friend, yeah. if you're going to have this deliberately uncharitable view of what I've said or done and keep doing the same thing when I've pointed it out and you're not even allowing me to, to explain what I've said or why I've said it. And you're making all of these assumptions. I don't have to waste my time with people like that. It, and that's what it is. It's just a waste of my fucking time. Which would made me think of another thing from crazy Christian white, crazy Christian Facebook friend. Oh yeah. Who? Okay. So, so he's Asian. So that has to be out there for this part. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. He, he crazy, told, crazy Asian Christian. Christian Facebook friend. We got to change the name. That's what it's got to be for now. Crazy <laughs> Asian <laughs> Christian Facebook friend. How? 
Um, so anyways, how many pronouns are we going to, it's, it's going to keep adding on the more crazier this guy gets. Uh, he was saying that I, like, I couldn't, I didn't have like a, a stake and it's something else trying to point out to him because I'm just a white guy with, uh, I want to say when you're white shame, you have white shame and that's yeah. why you were you, pointing out something to him. White, yeah. White like, well, guilt. like, like you don't, you, you, you're just, you're just a liberal that has white shame because you're white. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking oh, about? Oh, so you tried to, so he said something that was racist. Okay. And you tried to point that out. And yes. he's like, no, it's not racist. You just, just have, have white, this shame. white shame. And, you and so you, guilt. you feel yeah. like you have to call out yeah. all instances of what you think may be yeah, racist. It's not actually racist. You just have white shame. Uh, what was it that he posted? Do you remember? Oh, uh, more stuff about the Confederate flag not being like, I don't know why this guy is so obsessed with the Confederate flag. Uh, uh-huh. Oh, it, oh it that that one gotten on the post about the uh, uh, statues being removed in uh, oh, yeah, they want to be removed in thing. New Orleans, and I posted out there. I posted a photograph and everything on why I didn't. Uh, I completely agree with them being removed. I'm like right there in the lines, it says white supremacy in it. Mm-hmm. I'm like it's fucking racist. Yeah, the guy was a racist. That's why it's being fucking pulled down. I'm like they're not being erased from history. The guy legitimately was extremely racist he lost the fucking war he tried to revolt against the united states why the fuck should we honor him where else where else do you ever celebrate the loser of of a fucking war you don't you, yeah you just it's it's i guess the u.s the, the u.s yeah. where they complain about everyone getting a trophy yeah what <laughs> oh don't even get yeah, these, are, these are the same people who would <laughs> rail against that right yeah oh everybody gets a the participation tro- trophy, trophy. Including oh, the Confederates. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, the, the only Confederate flag that matters is the flag of surrender, the white flag of surrender. That's the that's the only the only one that really matters. I agree. We have something else from from Brandy. Okay, let's let's do that in just a minute. All right. Hi, this is Justin Schieber, formerly of the Reasonable Doubts podcast and currently of Real A Theology, and you are listening to The Godless Revolution. If you have questions, comments, concerns, compliments, corrections, criticisms, or concepts for content, contact the show via email at godlessrevolution at gmail.com, by text or voicemail at 330-81-REBEL, or Twitter the twatter at TGR Podcast. Thank you! From the White House to the pews, this is Rebel News. All right, I lied. We're gonna do the we're gonna do the brandy uh, thing for the Patreon subscribers. Uh, always lying, lying to them. I know, and I just said that I was gonna do the pro truth pledge, right? And, and you lied. Here I am lying. At least we're holding you accountable right. to it, you, and you, you haven't up. you haven't taken the pledge yet. So, oh, this is true. You're you're not actually bound by it. <laughs> I have I have some out for now. <laughs> for now, for the time being. Um, but I wanted to go through. I mean, there's been so much in the news. Of course, every yeah. day in it's Trumplandia, crazy. every 15 minutes is an adventure I mean, in damn. what the fuck just happened. Luckily for us, there is a website called What the Fuck Just Happened Today dot com. <laughs> I did not know that was. <laughs> it's there. awesome. Oh, uh, I'm gonna it's, have to check this out. It chronicles all of the different top top news story items that have happened in the Trump administration and here in the United States. It's created by Matt Kaiser, uh, but like like I said, the the name of the website and the URL is what the fuck just happened today dot com. Spelt out, not W T F. Correct. Today. Yeah. What the fuck just happened today dot com. It's awesome. Uh, number one uh, on yeah. day 133, and it's awesome because it chronicles it by day. Okay. So day 133 <sighs> is titled, It's Heating Up. Number one item on there is, The Trump Pulled the U.S. Out of the Paris Climate Accord. Dipshit. Prioritizing the economy over the environment and global alliances. Of course, they're not mutually exclusive. No. No. And what he's doing, I mean, he's he's saying that he's propping up the economy by propping up fucking coal mining of yeah. all things that is not a money making industry no it doesn't provide a whole lot of jobs either and it destroys the environment to boot so that's how fucking stupid our president is and i had actually watched a pretty interesting documentary on the coal mining industry a couple weeks back and yeah yeah it's shitty all around was it the coal miner's daughter 
No. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> what was it? I can't remember what the name it was right now, which is bad because I can't tell you to go watch it. Oh, that's uh, right. But basically, it had a lot of the old coal miners that were there saying, no, the coal mine, the industry has been dying since like the 80s. Like as far as industrialized or the me- mechanisms coming in there to take people away. So there's yeah, people been, working it's been the mines. dropping off for a while now. And then yeah. the fact that every promise they've ever had for retirement or medical benefits keep getting cut from their jobs, just making it horrible. Or a company will come in like, oh, yeah, you pay into this company and you'll get a retirement and medical out of it. And then they all retire and they find out, oh, that company closed its doors. Yeah. So I don't get shit now. So not only am I sick, I have cancer. Now I'm black lung disease. Now I've got no medical coverage and I don't have a fucking retirement. Now I'm fucking broke. And they want to repeal Obamacare. Yes. Which had specific provisions in it for coal miners. Because they were getting fucked over. Because they were getting fucked over. Yeah. Fantastic. I love our president. He's such a brilliant man. He is. He's making nice. America great again. Yes. When when is he gonna bring back the faux wood paneling industry? Because <laughs> yes. I, I I mean I've got a whole unfinished basement <laughs> that oh, I, I just I'm dying to put up the faux wood paneling that my parents had in the basement in the seventies. I thought you were referring to the car industry there because I was so waiting for a oh, faux yes. wood paneled. A, a station wagon to come back. Yeah, on the, on the trim on yes. the side. Yes. Oh, that's some sweet ass shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> Wood paneling on cars and in houses. That's yes. that's kick ass stuff, man. Make America can, great again. You can make a match. And I feel like you guys are somehow like like. De- denigrating it like making like <laughs> what's wrong with wood paneling on cars and in houses man it's um it's it's every american's dream you know what's wrong with it it's part of the 70s shit that in previous episodes i've said how much i hate <laughs> the 70s as a decade that's part of it man is that fucking wood paneling shit the color schemes the television shows, movies, hey, the hair, we're the gonna, hair, the clothing. We're gonna bring the shag back in carpet. Oh god. Yeah, the two-inch shag carpeting, every, the green stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't oh, forget the awesome. n- n- linoleum, linoleum floors linoleum, for your kitchen. Linoleum floors, yes. yes. Avocado-colored everything. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> A few years back, I had some water damage in my kitchen, and I had to pull up the linoleum, and there were, like, there were li- literally like 10 layers of linoleum dating just, back just over rotting. like 20 years. Or 20, 30 years, and some of the design patterns uh, that I was pulling up were oh, just awful. You should they have just, sent a sample of that to the Smithsonian so they could just stagger the I decades. I probably should have. I, I'm not a <laughs> sentimental guy, so I don't save a lot of shit. I, I should have saved it. That would have been, been a good museum piece. No, it wouldn't have. That would have been terrible. <laughs> Why would anybody do that? Why would anybody want anything to do with the 70s these days? Because they miss them. Saturday Night Fever. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) I have yet to get to experience the 70s, Dan, and I would like to at some point. Uh huh. I mean, you know, free sex. uh, You know. Yeah. Free Uh, free love. Yeah, yeah. I am looking forward to the 70s. Free everything. No, free love was the 60s, man. Well, okay. I am looking forward to the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what else have we got on what the fuck happened? Oh, well, and, and you know, the, the United States is the world's number two greenhouse gas producer behind who, China, I believe. <laughs> yeah, I would think so. And we're pulling out of this because we're going to make America polluted again. Yes, we yeah. are uh going to regress into yeah, 1940s America and uh China China is making more of a commitment to uh, the the green industry than America is. I mean, they're they're ramping up production. I mean, they're it's a whole new industry and we're losing the opportunity to be the world leader in in the green environment. Yeah, and they're shutting down their inefficient coal mine. Uh, not coal, I mean coal-fired plants. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, part of the information here on what the fuck just happened today.com says that Trump argued that the Paris Agreement would punish Americans by instituting onerous energy restrictions that stymie economic growth, while leaders around the world said the exit from the accord is an irresponsible abdication of American leadership. And I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah. We're allowing other countries to take the lead in renewable energy sources. And in creating those jobs and that technology elsewhere, we're, we're moving backward in time yeah. to fucking coal powered shit. 
instead of renewable energy and and new technology and clean jobs we're moving well, backward in time and fucking up the environment in the process it's just like when trump wanted to have the steam the steam powered uh launch thing for the new aircraft carrier yeah, yeah. i thought that what was a, i thought that was an God onion article damn. and i realized oh this is not the no onion. he really he wants really to wants fucking steam do that powered yeah <laughs> well he he just fundamentally misunderstands energy production in the energy industry and how it evolves over time yeah and how over generations you know we wood was our you know wood was the energy yeah and we had steam powered you know steam boats and shit like that based on wood that migrated into coal then to oil now natural gas is on the rise and green technology is next yeah no matter what he does it's not going to stop the evolution of of energy technology or energy innovation it's it's just going to hold us back yeah. as the rest of the world keeps moving it'll, forward and evolving their technology it, it'll right. delay the imp implementation inside the united states and we're going to be the backward fucking country yeah who just didn't get it and we're going to be buying all that technology from china and germany and france rather than developing it ourselves we're going to be india as part of his statements today trump actually fucking said when is when you know when when is the rest of the world going to start laughing at us because of the things we're doing? And I'm like, they're already laughing at us. They laughed at us when we elected you, dumbass, <laughs> yeah. as president. And they haven't stopped. And it just they're laughing harder all the fucking yeah. time when they're not shaking their heads or crying out of despair for how awful you are making things. Have you seen the meme where it said, uh, I, "I I predicted the the leader of the free world would be a woman." And I was right. Merkel. And it's Merkel. Uncle it's Merkel. Merkel. Yeah. yeah. We, we have abdicated being the, the, the leader of the yeah. free world. We have. <sighs> Congress is examining whether Jeff Sessions had a third undisclosed meeting with Russia's ambassador, Sergei Kislyak. And that could be really, really bad. Yeah. Even worse than the last one. Mm-hmm. Because he's, he's lied about it. He's, he's totally, yeah. Well, he lied about the last one, too, but... But it was, I mean, it was a little bit different because he was under oath, but he wasn't asked a direct question. He answered a question that wasn't his own. And then he came back. He was asked to correct his answer. He corrected his answer with the meetings. And then, but said there were only oath, two. But said there were only two under oath. And, and now there's this third one. So now he's lied about it under oath twice after correcting it. Mm -hmm. And also lied by not disclosing it on his uh Well, and then that too, yeah. Senators had asked James Comey to investigate Je uh, Jeff Sessions for possible perjury before Comey was fired by Trump. Quote, we are concerned about Attorney General Sessions' lack of candor to the committee and his false and his failure thus far to accept responsibility for testimony that could be construed as perjury. Senators Patrick Leahy and Al Franken wrote to Comey in their first request. The senators sent requests to Comey and, later, acting FBI Director Andrew McCabe in three letters dated March 20th, April 28th, and May 12th. There's all kinds of fucking new... Yeah. yeah. Trump wants to give Russia back their... Their, their, their property. Yeah. Their yeah. their little spy their, places, their manners in yeah. in, in Maryland and uh, New Jersey or wherever it was. Mm -hmm. One is in Maryland, the other is somewhere in the North. New Jersey just, or New York, somewhere. Yeah. Well, now they're saying there may be evidence that he was trying to lift the sanctions on Russia in the first week one, in office. One, and they're talking now about lower uh, lifting the sanctions. Yeah. Uh, Putin insists Russia never engaged in hacking, but praised Trump's lack of political background as a good thing. And Putin said that perhaps it was just very patriotic Russians who are interfering in yeah. America's election. And I am the yeah. most patriotic Russian. No, no, no state sponsorship of this, but just very patriotic Russians going out and fucking your sh with your shit. And I no, gave them patriotic, patriotic uh, participation ribbons. There, there's an Emmy Award winning or Emmy Award nominated, at least, Netflix series that, that deals with this exact yeah. storyline about patriotic Russians fucking with Americans called the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> our, our friends over at the two skeptical chaps across the pond from us may take interest in knowing that the former pro-Brick 
pro-Brexit UKIP leader, Nigel Farage is a person of interest in the FBI investigation into Trump and Russia. I don't uh, think that will come as a huge surprise nah. to a lot of people. No. Nah. They, need, they needed a middleman. Yeah. Tons and tons of, of just blatant, outright lies, falsehoods, obstruction of justice. And it's just this constant drumbeat that isn't getting any less. They're no. not backing off on any of this shit. They're steamrolling forward with it. Yeah. Like I said, he's trying to give Russia back properties that President Obama seized as part of sanctions against Russia for meddling in our elections. Yeah. And Trump's trying to give them back. Yeah. And negotiating with Russia. No, you can have them back if, uh, you know, you, you can get us good deals with this bank. And the, and the infuriating and nauseating double standard from, uh, from Trump supporters and the right. And, and not even just uh, people on the, I mean, people on the right who don't like Trump, but they, they don't want their party to get a black eye. Yeah. So, you know, they, they don't like Trump, but they're going to defend it anyway. Sitting back and making excuses on why all of this is okay. You know, I mean, Clinton had a fucking email server. Okay, fine. She had an email server. And, and that, that, I mean, fucking string her up and, yeah. and, and, you know, then Trump's giving send her to jail, but Trump does this. Yeah. And it's like, oh, it's no big deal. We shouldn't even think about Russia. Russia is anything. It's nothing. Well, then, then I mean, it's, oh, it's we, infuriating. They find out that Trump was released or uh, gave his personal cell phone number, his unsecured open line cell phone number to uh to Tr world trudeau leaders. and uh the uh, leader in mexico i can't remember what his name is right now and trudeau actually used it like yeah. trudeau called him on his cell phone i wonder if he did that he on was purpose like, hey what's up fucker yeah <laughs> you, you, you know this shit ain't secure right <laughs> you, you, you know you know you yelled at hillary for this right go fuck yourself the, the Canada, honestly say i mean that, the first thing i thought when the first thing i thought when i heard about that was that the reason he did that had nothing to do with being president or, or, or the country or anything like that. He's thinking about after the presidency, maintaining relationships with these people. Because you think he knows he's not going to be president for a few more months? Uh, whether <laughs> it's a few more months, another year, whatever. Yeah. He's, he's thinking long term about maintaining relationships with world leaders. Or I think he just doesn't care and he's just doing business as usual as he would with his or normal businesses. He's he can't just, do any wrong. I just wish somebody would find that phone number. Oh, and just publish that phone <laughs> number. Why can't somebody just publish that? The phone amount number? of dick pics he'd be getting. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah, what, what could we give Trudeau to release that? Phone oh number? my god! Just I would give Trudeau a foot rub. You know, it'd be awesome if he just started. Writing it on bathroom stalls <laughs> for, for a good time call. <laughs> uh, that on, wraps it up. Uh, oh, I was just going to say that wraps it up for the regular portion of the show this evening. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time and we ran out of time before we were able to cover a lot of other listener feedback that I told you two weeks ago we would get to yeah. before I was sick and then got discombobulated and had guests and did all this other stuff. And so I apologize. We still need to get to that. We will do that next week. And I know I've said well, that we, before. We have, we have no guests <laughs> next week, so we have more time to cover it. We That might actually change. We might have a guest next week, we so might... we might not have time to cover it. <laughs> so, so I don't know. We, <laughs> These guys are so on the same page here. We'll, we'll have to see. I, I meant to inform you before. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, we, we have a guest scheduled for two weeks from tonight that I will actually be in California. Oh. So I need to reschedule with them. I was going to see if they want to do it next week or the following week. So Okay. Yeah, so we may have a guest next week. We may not. I am not sure, but well, we will definitely try to get to the listener feedback that we've gotten on a bunch of different stuff that I just, we keep putting it off because we've got other stuff going on and, and I feel kind of bad about that, but <laughs> life is that way, man. But before we go, I want to thank our Patreon subscribers, Christy Kalbach, Andy, v Andrew Vodapich, Jefferson, Mo Cowbell, Wes Aaron, Utah Outcasts, Andy Faulkner, Angelica Pearson, Jeremy Goodson, Brandy Hamrick, Taylor Grin, Grant Larimer, Savitakuna, and The Gatheist. Thank you all very much. We appreciate it a whole lot. If you too would like to subscribe to the show, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash godlessrevolution and can be a patron of the show for as little as a dollar per episode. And 
if you contribute more, then there's other goodies that we'll throw your way. And that can be fun and stuff. Yeah. And we would really appreciate it. If you can't afford yeah. to be a patron of the show, we would greatly appreciate if you would rate it wherever you can. Share it with friends. Go out and like our Facebook page. Follow us on Twitter. Do all of those things. That helps bring the show, the show. Yeah, boost the show. Let other people see it. Um, and if you are, if you do become a Patreon subscriber, you will hear in the Patreon selection of, or the section of this week's episode where we cover the news story of Kentucky's mayor, Matt Bevan, and him saying, well, his solution to end violence is to pray about it. Yeah. He'll have roaming, he'll have roaming prayer, prayer errors. So that'll be fun. Prayer has been so effective so far. I'm sure, I'm sure it'll be ranty and ragey and I may yell a little bit in the Patreon portion of the show. Guaranteed. So, oh shit, real quick before I forget, tonight's closing song is Don't Pray and it's brought to you by Lexi and Brian of the Scenic City Skeptic Podcast. Until next week for everybody else, we say au revoir and I say crucify that like button. Leave a review to achieve nirvana. And as always, rate the show five times a day toward Mecca. of gold Thought I knew where to find that freedom Searching the pews But what did I know Open my eyes and set myself free from all the guilt and shame me. Now I'm wide awake and I can clearly see. Don't fear for my soul. Please don't pray for Solid rock into shifting sand with nothing left to hold on to. I got off of my knees and took a stand. Open my eyes and set myself free. All the guilt and shame that shackled me Now I'm wide awake and I can clearly see Don't fear for my soul Please don't pray for me Just one life and one chance to live it Make the most out of every day Take my hand, we can be good without God Change this world, leave it a better place Open my eyes and set myself free From all the guilt and shame that shackled me 
Now I'm wide awake and I can clearly see. Don't fear for my soul. Please don't pray for me. God damn! I was gonna say, can you go long uh, enough without coughing? That ought to do. <laughs> I don't know. Got them hackers all up in my business. All up in my business. Cause we're badass Merkins. This is a voluntary movement for people who want to join and are caring and to promote the truth. It's no, there's no pressure, no obligation. And it's just if you care about the truth, you join it. If you don't care about the truth, don't join it. Yeah. No one's forcing you to serve you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, there's no subtle message there. <laughs> no. You, you don't have to join if you don't care about the truth. No. <laughs> uh, I'm being very serious. No, you're, <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> like, Bye. 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 Mine. Are, are we Bye. Leaving? I, I had to do the, mine, my mine, name's mine, Ron mine, Bergen. Mine, mine, mine.